Good afternoon and time for another big hour at BBC Radio Silent. My name's Alex Dyke and in this slot we promise great music and great conversation. Today will be no exception. Colin Lester is with us now. He's a a music manager um, and he looks after some real A-list talent. Uh, But he's also um, connected to um, the Solent University. So that's why he's in Southampton. So Colin, welcome to the programme. Thank you very much. Pleasure Uh, to be here. So, Solent University, have you been there often? Um, As often as they invite me. I love lecturing, giving something back, um, talking to the students, and I probably learn as much as they do um, as they learn from me in their habits of buying music, creating music, um, and their vision of the future. It's, It's hard to keep up with it all these days. And I don't know if I'm... I don't think I'm just saying that because I'm getting older. But, of course, you and I are from uh, an age where if a record went into the charts, it would probably climb the charts over a series of weeks. It might stay at number one for six weeks, and it might take another four or five weeks to so slowly drop out of the top 30. Yep. When artists come and artists go so quickly, it's nearly impossible to keep up with, isn't it? It is, but that's the job. So, for me, I judge a record on how slowly it comes down the chart, ironically, as opposed to where it goes in the chart. All right. And that's really how to judge a hit record. So we uh, have an artist called Angel who recently had a single out that entered the... Actually, it entered the top 20 um, at number 20 and stayed at number 20 for about two weeks, then went to 19, uh, then went to 18. A uh, track's called Wonderful. And it stayed in the top 10 for nine weeks and we did 250,000 downloads on the track. Um, And that was his first single of an artist that we'd worked with over the last 18 months with BBC One Extra, just by creating a fan base and a base for people to understand who he is, what he's doing, so we're not totally reliant on the Radio One ILR playlists when it comes out because we know how limited they are. So that's really the new way of trying to hold up new artists and create an impetus where people sit and go, okay, I like it. And we're all aware that radio is the number one discovery, but people watch the most music and listen to the most music on YouTube. Is that a fact? Well, they're they're getting it all for free, Colin, there. Ish. You know, it's for free, yes. Mm. Mm. And look, the, the truth is I'd rather people watched it for free. But if you look at the statistics, the statistics are something in the region of 800 800 million unique um, users per month around the world are going on YouTube and approximately 40% of them are listening to music. But, yeah, but, but here's the big but, 20 seconds is the maximum time, is the average time, sorry, not maximum, is the average time that they're on it. So, again, we're in the McDonald's fast food business. You've got to be quick. You've got to get people quick. So people are surfing. Um, and when you say, are we monetizing? Well, actually, we are monetizing it in a, in a ridiculous way, but it's also a shop window, and we need shop windows for artists outside of radio. But surely that's only okay if they see Angel, watch Angel for 20, 25 seconds, and think, right, I'm going to now go and download that track. But if they're watching the tracks and storing them for free, then you're not going to make any money. And I said to my 12-year-old son, I was giving a lift home the other day, and he was listening to some stuff on his iPod. Asked him what he was listening to. Uh, Green Day was the answer. And I said, well, where did you get the money for that? He said, I got it for free. I said, what do you mean you got it for free? I got it off a friend at school for free. Did he pay for it? Probably not. How many of your friends pay for music? Hardly any. The girls, he said. The girls. So 50% of your, the market out there are getting it for free. That's got to be dangerous for you. It's not 50%. Um, it's probably that, that, that you've you pulled that statistic from, from thin air, and I wouldn't tell you the exact statistic because none of us really know what it is at the moment. However, we can sit in that world and say, yep, that's what's happening, okay, or we can move forward. And that's what we as an industry, as management, that's what we're doing. We're moving forward. So the future is streaming. There's no doubt about it that people will pay to stream music. They will pay for better quality. Obviously, there are the market leaders at the moment. You know, in streaming is Spotify. We're waiting for iTunes to come with their new streaming platform, which we all hope is going to be very good. What's wrong with saying When you say streaming, what exactly do you mean? Streaming is I'm going to pay a monthly subscription and I can listen to what I want to. I can't 
download it so I don't physically own it, but I can access it all of the time. That really is the future of, of, of listening to music. The old, and, and, and actually someone over at the university is just saying, oh, but your people want to own it. People, well, you, yeah, that's a very old-fashioned view. You don't really need to own it anymore. What you need to do is listen to it. You want to listen to it. And if I say to you, it's on your application, you can listen to it, then do I want to own it? Maybe you do, maybe I do, because we want to own the old Led Zeppelin, and guess what? We might want to own their vinyl, because we think it's great. But kids today don't give a damn. They really don't. It's like, I want to hear it. I don't even read. They, kid, ask, ask your son who produced the record. Ask him anything about the sleeve notes and he'll look at you like you're around the bend. Mm. So when you're talking about what you and I did, it's a completely different world. They don't care. They're not interested about who produced the record, who wrote the song, who produ you know, who, where the arrangements came from. You, I certainly was. So if you accept that's the future, people want to listen to music. So if you give them a subscription with a phenomenal access to, to listening to, um, I don't know, if, if, they, if your son's sitting at home thinking... I'd like listening to American AOR rock today. And he puts that into the search engine of Spotify. He can listen to that. And he may find that he likes it. And then think, I'd like to buy this album. I'd like to actually put this thing on my application, whether it be an iPad, iPod, et cetera, et cetera. Or he may just pay a subscription. But he's got a choice. So he's not just being given what radio decide to give him. And that has to be the future. Because if you steal the you know, if people continue to down, and the trend has slowed down, by the way, M music is less music is being stolen now than has been. It is slowing down. And that is not really because of any policies that the government's come up with. I think it's the industry working together with government and actually making stuff more available to the younger consumer to say, OK, this is what we're going to give you. And actually, you don't have to pay to go on Spotify, but you've got to listen to commercials. But once you're in... Yeah, we um, all hate that deal. We want deal? to skip the commercials, don't well, then, we? Well, then pay twelve ninety nine for it. OK, we'll be back in a mo. You mentioned Led Zeppelin, uh, so I'm going to play some Led Zeppelin. Let's go for rock and roll. Colin Lester is with us. And I like what he says, but I don't agree with a lot of what he says, but we'll tackle that after this song.
That's rock and roll from Led Zeppelin. And I'm with Colin Lester, and we're talking about... Colin's a, 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 a top-rate music manager, and he's looked after Craig David and Travis and the Arctic Monkeys and the brand-new Heavies and loads of other people too. And we're talking about the state of the, uh, the music industry. And he was talking uh, before Led Zeppelin about downloading and uh, streaming and all of that. I, I do think people want to own the stuff. It doesn't have to be as tangible as it once was, you and I reading the sleeve notes and maybe, maybe even sniffing the cover because it smells of brand new cardboard yeah, or whatever. And, and all of that. That was part of the excitement of getting it. But I do still think we want to, uh, I do still think we want to own it. And the, the fact that you'll be on a drip paying for it, within two weeks, some smart kid will realise how they can get round that, won't they? Well, no, because if you if you own something, you are limited to the space of the application you're putting it on. So, you know, if you convince your if your son convinces you to get the 64 gig or whatever it is new application, or you know, they're, you're going to say, why don't you get the 16? That's great. You know, I want you to have the 16 because it's the cheapest. And he will say, well, I want the 64. And eventually. Even 64, once he's put a couple of films down, because we're not just talking about music. You know, if we were just talking about music going on these applications, then I understand that. But kids today are not just listening to music. They're, they're downloading the in-betweeners. They're downloading things that interest them visually as well as, you know, from an audio point of view. And that's taking up space. And then they're downloading all ridiculous social networking sites. That's taking up space. So their space is being taken up. So... When the prices increase, which they will, and we move to the next, you know, size 100 and whatever it is and however far it goes, these prices are going to increase. And it's going to be more efficient and cost efficient to say, well, actually, as long as I can access my music at any time and I don't need to have it on my actual application because the cloud does that for me. And guess what? I can get it on any application anywhere in the world. I can check into a hotel and actually put in my password and have all of my stuff that I'm paying for plus streaming stuff, well, actually, isn't that a better deal? I mean, you know, not how I started, not ideally what I love. And guess what? I never opened the albums to smell them because it was cooler to keep them shrink-wrapped, you know? So Really? Oh, come on. Who were you come hanging on. about with oh, shrink-wrapping shrink your albums? People that create value. If you can start... You, oh. you, you, well, you yeah. are a multi-millionaire businessman. Uh, I wished. Um, right. The other, do you know the other problem you've got, Colin? Yes. I haven't even started Tell me about all my problems, because I'd like to know. The other problem you've got is that some of your bands, um, like Angel, some of your artists, there's yes. a current, yeah. current one for you, Angel, uh, not only are they going to uh, compete with other people in the top 40, mm -hmm. but they've got to compete with the Beatles and Dylan and T-Rex and Bob Marley and Oasis and Keen and people like... And anyone who's come before them, because we're all out there now buying the oldies. Now, when you and I were kids, you may have got the old Bill Haley album for Christmas, but you weren't dealing with... I don't want to call them golden oldie artists because they're credible contemporary artists, in my opinion, but you're dealing with that as well. Well, I chose Craig, da Craig David's first single, OK, and this will sum up exactly what you're saying. There was a line in Fill Me In that said young people... that says, young people doing what young people do, parents trying to find out what they're up to, OK? Simply, children want their own music. They want their own generation. And actually, now, when you look at, you know, I don't know where it was, where, what, what the generation was from the Beatles to punk rock to whatever your parents were saying, turn that mess, turn that's rubbish, turn that in rap came along and like, what is this? There's no tune in rap. and there's a... Generationally, kids want their own thing. So when you go back and say, well, you know, Bob Dylan, Angel, and you put them in the same... Well, breath. yes, yeah, but those no, no, two. But, but, but when you put them in the same breath, you, you actually, there is a defining moment there because I'm a huge Bob Dylan fan, but that doesn't mean to say that I don't know what today's market, what today's generation want. And if I didn't know or understand or be able to employ people or work with people that understood that, I'd be out of the business. Yeah, but if you were buying records in the, in the 1970s as a teenager, right, yeah. and you were going to buy your Stranglers, your Boomtown Rats, your Jam or whatever, and you were buying singles or maybe buying albums, the fact that you couldn't hear or get Jerry Lee Lewis or Little Richard or... Bill Haley or whatever, yep. the fact that they weren't in your space, they weren't in your zone, you, you didn't want them because you didn't know about them. Now, young kids, 
they, you know, they like Angel, they like Craig David, but they also are aware of The Who and Michael Jackson. Which and is that, fantastic. Yeah, I think that's great. Yeah, yeah. but my point is, Colin, that they're going to want that for Christmas. as w- So less people are going to want Angel because some of them are going to, well, do I want Angel or do I want Michael Jackson? Actually, I'll go for Michael Jackson. Fantastic. It couldn't be better for me because guess what? You can't buy a Michael Jackson ticket, unfortunately, but you can buy an Angel ticket. So when you look at the business the way it's turned around today, the vast majority of income is not in records. It's ancillary income, which is live income, which is merchandise, which is endorsement deals, which is all of these things. All right, the next song is Fill Me In from Craig David. Checking this girl next door when her parents went out She phoned, say, hey, boy, come on right around So I knock at the door, you were standing with a bottle of red wine Ready to pour, dressed in a long black satin, laced to the floor So I went in, then we sat down, stopped kissing, caressing Told me about jacuzzi, sounded interesting So we jumped right in All calls diverted to answer phone Parents were kind of cool, but they were the fine line between me and you. We were just doing things and people in love do. Parents trying to find out what we were up to. Saying, Why were you creeping round late last night? But then I see two shadows moving in your bedroom light. Now you're dressed in black when I left, you were dressed in white. Can you feel me? was clear and she'd ask me to come out I'd say hey girl come right around so she knocked to the door I was standing with the keys in my hand to the 4 by 4 jumped in my ride checking and nobody saw the club we went in we got down bound bound to the rhythm so it was early morning thought we better be leaving so I gave you my jacket for you to hold told you to wear it cause you felt cold I mean me that in to break the rules I weren't trying to play your mom and dad for fools We were just doing things young people in love do Parents trying to find out what we were up to Saying why can't you keep your promises no more Saying you'll be home by 12 controlling in at 4 Out with the girls but leaving with the boy next door Can you feel me? See two shadows moving in your bedroom light Now you're dressed in black When I left you were dressed in white Can you feel me? Can you feel me? Yeah. Oh, I've had it to answer phone Red wine bottle have the contents gone Midnight return jacuzzi turned on Can you feel me? BBC Radio Silent, that's Craig David. Um, So, Colin, Craig David, lad from Southampton, fill me in. How does he arrive at your doorstep and what do you do to make him a superstar? What was your your part in it? Um, That's a great question because, as I explained to a lot of people, we can write history as we want to write it. So I could say I was the genius that discovered him in Southampton, took him down to London, put him in the studio, made a record and... um, got it out to the record companies and radio stations played it. And because of my incredible work as an A&R man and as a manager, we put that record in at number one and sold 7 million copies. Okay. History could say that, but actually the truth 
couldn't be more far removed from that because managers don't do that full stop. We are, we are the caretakers of great music. So actually we work with people that deliver great music. And the truth behind that is I heard a track from, from actually the Artful Dodger, which was called Rewind, which got my attention because it slowed down in the chorus. I thought it was a phenomenal track. Um, and I thought it was great to hear something that slowed down in the chorus yet felt it wasn't commercial at the time but Radio 1 playlisted it it was a great record but the thing that really got me was this kid singing Craig David all over your point on it I thought love that and got hold of his manager at the time met up with his manager uh, who played me a song called Walking Away and that song completely took over everything I was doing at the time I just in the view of a 17 or 18 year old kid writing those lines I'm walking away from the troubles in my life, walking away trying to find a better day. From a 17-year-old living in a council estate, the Holy Rood Estate here in Southampton, meant so much to me, just because as a manager, I love music. I'm not in this business because I want to be rich and famous. I don't want to be famous. Of course I'm commercial. Of course I'm in the business to make money, but that's not the reason. Do the right thing and the money will follow. And when that one song with that line crossed my stereo that was it i had to i had to come down and meet him and the reason that record was successful was because of craig david and mark hill who's also here from southampton who had an association together worked down in some really dungy horrible place down in the docks that i think has been redeveloped to some ridiculously expensive apartments now and they made a record that came from their heart that came from what they felt was happening in the world today do you think that record has got southampton in it i think it's relevant to a movement and a generation of people. I don't think it's about Southampton in the slightest, unfortunately, but clearly... It would have been great if you'd said yes. That would have been on the sound bike going around here for years and years and years. Yes. But you're honest, and I like yes. it. Yes, I can agree with that, but no, it didn't have anything to do with Southampton. It had, And that's why, quite honestly, that's why it sold around the world. Because one of my biggest, I guess, challenges was taking Coles to Newcastle. And everyone said to me, who wants an R&B kid in America? I mean, you know, who needs R&B? That's where it comes from. You know, let's so don't need a British kid doing it. Some British kid from Southampton that no one had heard of. It wasn't like, you know, oh, is this British kid comes from Liverpool. Ah, oh, Beatles, we know that. We know that. It wasn't. It was Southampton. And that's the irrelevance of what I'm saying. It was a British kid. And it was, I made it a personal, a personal mission to go out there and break it, which nearly cost me my marriage, my everything, because I spent so long there. Really? And you, well, you have to be there. You can't, you know, you go, America's a great country, right? You go in there and you go to LA, there's no such thing as a bad meeting. You don't do bad meetings. Oh, we love you, man. You're great. Oh, man. You, this is fantastic. Get the jerk out of here. So, you know, that's America. They, they, to your face, they'll, they, they love you. You walk away, they hate you. So you have to keep going back in. You have to keep, you have to be there in their faces, keep going. And that's what we had to do with Craig. How did you break him in America? When, when, when was the day when uh, Howard Stern was talking about him and he was getting played on the hottest station in New York? What happened? It was a very gradual process. It just, it, it suddenly started climbing the charts. You started seeing the statistics of what it was selling. Um, and then you know because the offers start coming in. Where's Craig now? What's he doing? Craig now is um, in Miami. He's living in Miami at the moment. He's comes back quite frequently. In fact, he was in Southampton at his mum's last week. Um, so he comes back from time to time. But he's actually doing um, a radio show at the moment from his home in Miami for a um, commercial radio station that I may or may not mention, KISS. He does a weekly show from his apartment in Miami and he's just making a new album. And I think he flies the flag uh, for Southampton. He flies the flag for England and I think he has the right to spend his money in a way that he feels makes him creatively and emotionally in the best position to give what he thinks his, you know, his, his, his consumers or the audience want. We're talking to Colin Lester and we are back in a mo. Well, this afternoon should be drier. Brighter conditions are going to follow with uh, sunny spouts. Maximum temperature 12 Celsius, 54 Fahrenheit. Tonight, the wind will ease a little, allowing temperatures to fall close to freezing. Uh, this gives a risk of ice forming on untreated surfaces. Minimum temperature 2 Celsius, 36 Fahrenheit. Uh, Tuesday, a chilly start with a risk of some ice on untreated roads here in the south, but generally dry in the BBC Radio Solent area anyway. Sunny spouts uh, during the morning of tomorrow. Staying mostly dry through the afternoon, but becoming cloudier with one or two showers developing. Maximum temperature, 8 Celsius, 46 Fahrenheit. 
How's it looking your end, Jude? Do you know, it's not looking too good. Most of our major routes are running very well, but in Cotsham, Wait Street's closed just along from the police station because of an accident. The actual closure is between the High Street and Albert Road. In Ride, a collapsed sewer means Castle Street has just been closed. The closure there runs between Union Street and Union Road, so not too far, but it might go on until the 14th of December. Wimborne, thanks for lots of calls. Julian's Bridge has single file traffic for some emergency work at the moment. Hopefully that will end before this afternoon's rush hour. Next bulletin, just before one. Thank you very much. Cena hold up. Call the BBC Radio Solent Travel Hotline. 0345 30 40 961. Back with Colin Lester in a few seconds' time. As 2012 began, BBC Radio Solent asked, was it a happy new year? A hundred listeners signed up to join our happiness panel, having their mood measured as the seasons went by. Well, now it's December, and are our hundred on the way to a happier Christmas? We'll hear the final results of our special study and meet some of those who took part throughout the day next Monday. Happy Talk on BBC Radio Solent. That's Travis. And why does it always rain on me? And uh, Colin Lester is uh, is with us. He's one of rock's top managers. And he actually, look, you look very, very rock and roll. Um, if you're expecting Colin, when I say rock and roll, I don't mean he's got a, a ponytail and a long beard and a leather jacket. <laughs> but that is the most expensive jumper I've ever seen. Even George Michael couldn't afford that jumper. Well, you see, that, that's the problem with being an artist. It's <laughs> a nice jumper. Right, <laughs> you've got you a story about that song by Travis, and then I've got to put you right on a few things. OK. You um, keep trying to change the subject. No, 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 no. I'll never change the subject. But, uh, you know, opinionate is something that, that, that most managers w- w- will have, or most successful managers will have. So... You know, the thing about managers, as I've said to you, it's, it's, it is about the artist. 
But it's also about the manager's relationship with people, with radio stations, with record companies, with, you know, today, with brands. I mean, relationships are very, very important. Access to brands, access to the, the, the live promoters, the agents. But one of the most important relationships that people never really think about is the relationship with God. Okay? So I'm just going to tell you that my relationship with God paid off with Travis because we were seven singles into that campaign, including the first album, Good Feeling. And actually, we were a million pounds in the hole to the record company Independiente, having toured with Oasis, having toured with Virtually. We toured with so many acts opening for them, and we'd sold very, very little. First album, 30,000 albums. We were now into the, um, I think, third single of The Man Who, Why Does It Always Rain On Me? And that was sort of struggled through the first two singles, Driftwood, which is one of my favourite Travis songs, um, and right into Reach You. And off we went to play Glastonbury on a beautiful, beautiful summer's night. And it was a really, really lovely evening, and they were on stage, on the main stage, about 6 o'clock. And I bowled up in my less expensive jumper because at that point, of course, I didn't have too much money. And um, as I got there, you know, I thought, what a lovely, great night. It was a beautiful evening. This is going to be a great gig. And the band went on stage at six o'clock. Sun was shining. It was absolutely fantastic. And halfway through the set, they went into Why Does It Always Rain On Me? At which point the clouds came over and it started to pour down with rain. I mean, bucket down with rain during Why Does It Always Rain On Me? And as the song finished, the sun came out again. And it was the most incredible experience. And what made that record break, it was the first year that the BBC and BBC Radio 1 had covered Glastonbury in its entirety and that BBC 2 were running it. So that became the massive story of Glastonbury that year that actually Travis brought the rain out. Okay, so, you know... The answer is, my relationship with the good Lord paid off there. But the truth <laughs> is, behind the, 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 the moral behind that is, you never know where it's coming from. Did the band realise they were a million pounds in the red? As young men, don't they care? They're making music, man. You can deal with that. Or are they thinking, oh my goodness me, we get one more crack at this and then we're out with a big bill. How does it work? Well, there's a line that answers that. that I don't, I, Fran Healy could answer that in a lyric um, where he says... Um, um, I can't stand myself. I'm being held up by invisible men um, in Why well, Does It Always Rain On Me? And what he's actually saying is, I can't stand on my own. I'm being held up by invisible men being management, record company, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so the answer to the question is in his lyrics. Um, you know, I think that answers the question. OK, let's move on to this. Uh, when the interview started, we disagreed about downloading music, buying music and all, and, and all of that. And then I said, you've got the uh, the heritage market, as I guess it's called now. Um, and, and with the young guys, you're up against that. And then you said, well, unfortunately, Michael Jackson, Elvis Presley, Frank Sinatra, they're not around anymore. You see, they are. They are still around. They're around on video. And this is the future. I saw the Frank Sinatra show a few years ago at the Palladium in London where they uh, used um, live musicians and uh, Frank was on the big video screens. They've done the same with Elvis Presley for years and years and years, the original Vegas bango out. And it's only a matter of time before the Jackson Five, because there are still five of them, uh, get back together and Michael is on the big screen. And that is going to be the big ticket, Colin. Remember where you heard it, it's coming. And that is the future because... So OK, you're, and, and, is this the same conversation we had a minute ago that you said that we need to actually go back to like records and go back to reading you know, the real deal? We want, we want records, we don't want to stream it, we want to own it, we want to smell it, we want to, we want to be everything to do with what it was. Yet you've just said the future is synthetics made up. So we're going, into, we're going to go into this Disney world of where we put characters like they did in, in, in Coachella recently. You know, for me, that doesn't, that doesn't work. That's entertainment. And of course... We're in the entertainment business. We are in the entertainment industry, but I'm in the industry of breaking new talent, working with new talent, selling tickets. There's always going to be a heritage. But guess what? Artists that I started working with potentially have heritage value now. If you don't, you, you can only create heritage by creating something new. So at some point, it has to be new to become heritage. And there's a debate. Yeah, I agree is, with that. Is U2, what, what are U2 at the moment? Are U2 a current band or are they a heritage band? Well, actually... The argument, I would say, is they're a heritage band. Their new stuff was phenomenal, but a fan will be listening to this going, Colin, you're off your rocker, their new album was the best I've ever heard. So that's subjective, that's up to them. But the question is, when does something, you know, if you, if you don't make new music, you don't have a heritage. And that's why Americans don't have 
much culture, you know, in a lot, in big parts of their countries, because when something's old, they knock it down mm. and they build it new again. We keep our heritage. Music has a heritage and long may that continue. So you and I agree. But if I can't go and see it, um, I mean, I didn't go and see the Rolling Stones. Why didn't I go and see it? Because I'd rather watch a, a, a video or a DVD of the 1969 free concert in Hyde Park. That's me. I'd rather go and do that and go and see a bunch of, you know... But in my world, you can have them as you want them, at whatever stage, whatever absolutely. age you want them at. You can have them in holograms, you can have them on big video screens. I don't want them in holograms. I never... I, 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 but I, they're forever gorgeous in 1969. Yeah, they're not I, old and wrinkled. No, but I'm listening to the, the whole event. It's, it's, it's an experience. You know, the whole thing about yeah, but 69 we are is getting, the constant. We are getting... You're nostalgic. I'm, I'm actually somewhere no, in the middle I'm, of being, con, 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 being very, very... I'm futuristic. I've, I've jumped over you. I've gone from heritage to jumping over all the Craig David and the Angel stuff, and now I'm in the future with some heritage acts. The other thing that you have not considered, Colin, and you should, because I'll save you millions, okay. is... Well, make them for me, don't save them. Music and festival fatigue. There are so many festivals and so many gigs out there. You're in the... You're in the you are in danger of killing the goose that lays the golden egg. Why? Because there's, there's too much of it out there now, and festivals are starting to fail. OK, your Isle of Wights, your Glastonbury's, your Best of All, your Carrot Best of All, your Reading Festival, they're always going to do OK. So many have fallen by the wayside because there's so many of them. And Mean Fiddler have paid the price for that. You're absolutely right. It's not something we don't know. It's not something I'm not aware of. Look at the Mean Fiddler going bankrupt recently with a lot of their festivals. But they still have some great festivals that are in their portfolio, some of which you just mentioned. And... Of course, ticket prices are down. Of course, you know, as a, as, as, as a natural progression, people saw it as a growth market and there was ridiculous amounts of festivals. But actually, the truth is, the Reddings will always be there, the Glastonbury's will always be there, you know, the, 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 the ones in, in Fiji, you know, the rock festival. There's always going to be the one in Germany. There's always going to be festivals that we know are brands that are there forever. Everything else comes and goes. It's a bit like music. And you know what? You take your choice, you take your money. If someone offers me a festival called, I don't know, um, Southampton Rocks and wants to pay one of my artists X amount of pounds to it. Do I actually care if Southampton Rocks, no disrespect to Southampton, if it's not your money, council and, and, and taxpayers' money, um, do I care if it makes money or not? Is that my job to do that? My job is to make sure that my artist makes money. So when you say to me it's reducing, of course it is. But for people that offer my artists and artists in the industry a fee to play... And if that is correct, then there is an audience there. The brand, because let's not forget, I'm a brand manager now, not really a rock and roll manager. The brand is what we're really selling. And if we can sell our brand to more people and make money in the process of that, the actual festival brand isn't my problem. I'm not a promoter. So I may not be as sort of smart as having holograms all over the place. And, and guess what? I don't own the rights, so therefore it wouldn't help me anyway. <laughs> right? But actually... <laughs> I might not be in it, but that's not my area of business. I'm working with artists. I'm an artist manager. My, my, my fundamental job is to promote and create the brand of my artists on a global basis. But what are we going to do, just summing up here at the end, what are we going to do when X Factor comes and goes c so quickly? You can't remember who was in what one. It, uh, you told me that you looked after Leanne Mitchell, who won the BBC thing, The Voice. Yes. Where is she now? She's at home. Well, she's I mean, off the radar, though, isn't she? No, but she's off the radar because we particularly didn't want to put the winner of that programme out amongst all the other stuff that's been coming out around it. So the new series of the show is out um, next year, early part of next year, which um, is running on the BBC. And Leanne will feature as a very big part in the opening of that and will show the reasons why the winner is the winner of the show. And I'll be totally honest with you, Leanne Mitchell is not an artist I would have signed. So if you look at my history of, of, of artists that I've worked with, I wouldn't sign Leanne Mitchell. She's very, very different, more operatic. But my God, what a singer. And when I turned up to the studio and listened to her sing, I was so bold, so bold away. And I said to the record company at the time, I said to Universal, guys, she's better than just winning this competition we're going to bang it out we've got to work with this person we have to work with the talent she is the nearest voice i've heard to barbara streisland since barbara streisland and i don't think that that's an immediate market you can't say right mm. let's get that record out let's get it on radio too you know it needs thought it needs time it needs nurturing something the record business the record industry is really not used to so i've pulled the faders down 
given her the opportunity to develop and make a record that hopefully gives her the best opportunity Well, good. So she's succeed. not Because so many of these ones are just forgotten and they are yesterday's news and the new lot come along and they're red hot for 10 minutes. And sure. I think that must be very, very hard for these young people to, uh, to deal with, you know, I afterwards. Think I think it's fair. Not only is it hard, I think it's cruel. And I don't get involved in that sort of mass turn them around, put it out. In fact, the other artist that I'm working from there is a guy called Max Milner, who was on the show. Um, he was, he was just, I liked him because he was a little bit left of centre and I thought that he had a really good attitude. Um, sort of, you know, he, he hated everything about the show, actually. But he had an attitude that was about music. He claimed, came in and played me some songs on acoustic guitar and we've just actually completed a tour with him in the UK to sort of, you know, three, four hundred capacities. We're investing as a management company in making his new album that will be out um, early next year and we'll build it ourselves and develop the artists ourselves because we believe in their music. So he could have just fallen off the radar. I'm in it because I believe in the talent. I don't watch talent shows. The truth is, and I've been very very honest about it, I don't watch The X Factor. I don't watch BGT. They make me sick. The only <coughs> thing that I love is... I'm a celebrity, get me out of here. I love that program. I mean, you, 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 if you put that on every night of the week for six months, I'd watch it. Really? I love, oh, I love watching people getting paid to do stupid things for no other reason than they want publicity out of it. I mean, that's entertainment, okay? <laughs> and it's free entertainment. I think it's fantastic. But actually, using people, because the difference is, and this is the point I'm making, they know what they're going into. They know when they're doing it, what they're going into. The difference with these talent shows is, they don't know what they're going into. So for me, that's not necessarily the sort of entertainment. But however, I will say, and this is a very important point, that they are entertainment shows. And I think that as an entertainment show, The X Factor is entertaining. My family loves it and, and lots of people love it. And it's it. very well done. And it's very well done. So what my personal view is irrelevant. I think it's a phenomenal family entertainment show. And guess what? I'm in the entertainment business. So I would endorse it. It's just the artists that come off it. Just need a little bit more of, you know, love and attention. OK, look, we've run out of time. I've loved talking to you, Colin. You know, Simon Cow is sat there and sometimes opportunity presents itself to Simon Cow and sure. he makes a lot of money. That has happened with you today. I'm a middle-aged DJ, right? There's a big future for middle-aged DJs. Absolutely. Right? I've got no management. I'll stand up. I'll give you a twirl. Are you going to take me on? 80% of your income and I'll take you on. Really? 80%? I thought you were meant to get 20. No, 15. No, you missed the point, you see. Artists take 80% of the income. I know, that's what yeah. I'm saying. I don't understand that. How does that work for me? What, because you make them... Who, because it's their talent. You're, you're nurturing their talent. It's their talent. Yeah, it's their talent. You couldn't I'm go ready. out and sell out Do the NBC what? Radio Hall, could you? I never thought about that. Come on. OK, make me a star. You're on. Let's take on New York. You're, and do you know what? Because it's you, I'll do it for 5%. <laughs> Thank you very oh, much, Colin. Of the gross. <laughs> I hope you come back and do this again. It's been fun. My pleasure.